Welcome to Open Classroom, the Brown School's Digital Forum for Community and Conversation. I'm Danny Pape, Director of Career Services at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. I want to quickly do a little housekeeping so you know uh, kind of how today's webinar is going to work. First, we are using a webinar format, which means we can't see or hear you as uh, an attendee. Um, but we would love to know your thoughts and questions, so feel free to post those in the chat uh, as we'll have a Q&A um, at the end of the session. We're also uh, streaming live right now on YouTube. So if you have a friend or who couldn't join us in this virtual room but still want to watch us live, we'll put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat in just a moment. I also wanted to let you know about a future, uh, some future open classroom programs we have that you can still register for uh, as we finish out the year strong. On Thursday, December 1st, the Brown School will put on a panel on reproductive justice through the lens of social work, public health, and social policy. On Tuesday, December 6th, the study of asked adolescent lives after migration to America will host a session on strategy, strategies to support multilingual learning in US schools. And on Thursday, December 8th, we'll continue our artificial intelligence series with applications of AI and big data analytics in obesity research. We'll put a link to our Open Classroom webpage in the chat so you can see all the Open Classroom webinars and get registered if you'd like. But now to today's program, Social Work Response to the Election. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Lewis, the founder and director of the Congressional Research Institute for Social Work and Policy. Dr. Lewis, I'll let you explain the genesis of this program if you'd like and introduce our awesome panelist. Okay, thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> and hello, everybody, and welcome to our discussion about the recent uh, midterm elections. I'm sure that uh, uh, there was a lot of surprises for some of us, and uh, we want to dig into it and, and see what, what challenges and opportunities it may have for social workers. Uh, but before I get started, uh, I would like to remind everyone of the upcoming 2023 Macro United Conference that will take place in June, June 2nd to the 4th at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, the, uh, we're gonna put the, uh, the uh, link to the, to the conference website in the chat <clears throat> and uh, proposals for the conference are due December 1st. If you go on to the uh, website, it will say November 1st, but it has been extended to December 1st, so you can still get your proposal in. Just a reminder that uh, on Thursday, June 1st, there will be a teaching institute uh, that you might be interested in as well. So I am here with uh, several of my political social work colleagues. Uh, we all kind of identify and operate in that field. And I, <clears throat> I just want to uh, uh, give you an opportunity to uh, learn uh, uh, with where they're, what the thinking is. So I wanna, I wanna start by talking about the youth vote. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, watching this vote for, for a while now. And it played a significant role in our in the uh, in the midterm. So I just wanted to share with you a few facts uh, regarding the youth vote. Uh, let me. I have a PowerPoint. Hold on for one second. Okay. I'm supposed to be, I should have been slick with this, okay? Well, <clears throat> our first slide, we'll, we'll see that uh, that the youth vote has uh, increased uh, slightly, but I mean, significantly. And if you, if you uh, look at this chart, you'll see that up until uh, 2014, it had kind of been pretty level uh, at uh, about uh, 20, 
3.3% of the youth voting in uh, midterm elections. But then in 2018, after the election of Donald Trump, you see that they've got more uh, engaged in, and, um, and motivated to go to the polls to have something to say. And because of their participation in 2018, uh, the uh, House, the uh, Democrats gained the House and the Senate. And, uh, and they did not uh, participate in the same numbers in 2022, but they still had a significant impact. And as you can see from this um, chart that uh, they favored the Democrats uh, almost two to one in the, in the midterm elections. And that helped to swing a lot of our uh, house seats so that there was an anticipated, uh, we all heard about the red wave and even the red tsunami that never materialized because, uh, and it was partially because of the youth vote. So this, this snapshot gives you a, uh, a look uh, at how um, the different segments of the youth population voted. Uh, for the, for the uh, choices in the House of Representatives. And you can see that they all uh, pretty much went Democratic. Uh, obviously, the Black vote went heavily Democratic and uh, Latino vote followed suit. And uh, even the white vote, had, the majority went Democratic. And uh, <clears throat> just to give you a snapshot of who these young voters are, and they are from uh, ages 18 to 29. And you can see by race and ethnicity, how they identify. And these are from the exit polls. So they are not, you know, uh, the definitive uh, numbers. Those numbers will be out sometime uh, in, the, uh, in the spring when the census releases the number. But this is, this gives us a snapshot of, uh, who, who these voters were. So among the, uh, 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 the Black youth, they were heavily uh, identified as Democrats, um, almost two thirds identified as Democrats. Uh, Latinos were not as heavily uh, identifying as Democrats. Uh, they kind of split between uh, the independent and, and, and even more Republicans, 20% of the Latino vote uh, went uh, Republican uh, or identified as Republican. And maybe Louisa can talk about that, you know, at some point during this, uh, during our, our, our presentation. And white youth is almost evenly split. So we can't assume that, you know, all youth are gonna be voting uh, at the same in the same rate. And finally, this is a slide uh, showing how uh, youth voted, uh, youth use choices by gender and by LGBT identification. Uh, young women uh, of all, of all uh, persuasions, almost 75, almost uh, three quarters of them were identified as Democrats. Uh, more, a little slightly more than a half uh, of young men identified as uh, Democrats. And then we can see the difference when you split the LGBT vote, uh, which was definitely uh, Democratic and the non-LGBT uh, vote. So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this um, because I wanna get to our panelists. But what this chart tells us is that young voters pay to take, prioritize abortion. Uh, there was a lot of talk leading up to the midterms that uh, the abortion issue had lost its impact because inflation was now the main uh, concern and crime. But if we uh, look at these charts, we'll see that among young people, ages 18 to 29, it was the primary impact. Uh, the, when, uh, when they, the respondents were asked, uh, what was your top issue? 44% of the young people said it was abortion. 
and we can see smaller uh, percentages from other groups. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to introduce our panelists and they will uh, present in the order of their introduction. First, we have Justin Hodge, who is a clinical assistant professor of social work at the University of Michigan. He is the co-lead for the policy and politics, political social work pathway, and director of online certificate in political social work. Justin was elected to the Washington County Board of Commissioners, that's in Michigan, in November 2020, and he was reelected again. Uh, in 2021, Justin was appointed by Governor Whitmer, who also uh, had a good day in, 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 uh, on the, during the midterms, to the Commission on Community Action and Economic Opportunity, where he contributes his expertise at the state level. Uh, he's also president of the Board of Directors of both the Congressional Research Institute for Social Work and Policy and the Social Work Democracy Project. Thank you, uh, Justin. Our next panelist is Marla Blunt Carter, who is an Associate Professor of Professional Practice at Rutgers University School of Social Work. Marla is a political operative and has successfully guided the campaigns of quite a few elected officials, including her sister, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware, who was reelected re to Congress again in the midterms. Lisa Blunt Rochester, uh, prior to joining the faculty at Rutgers, Marla served as the projects manager and director of constituent services in the Senate office of then Senator Joseph Biden. She was the state director for the 2008 Obama Biden presidential campaign and a senior agency liaison in the executive office of the president during the Obama administration. And what can I say about Mimi Abramovitz? <laughs> Uh, she recently retired her position as the Bertha Capen Reynolds Professor of Social Policy at the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College. She is a board member of Influencing Social Policy and a board member of the Social Democracy Project. Mimi is the co-founder of the Welfare Rights Initiative at Hunter College and currently co-leads the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign also known as Voting is Social Work. She recently received the Significant Lifetime Achievement in Social Work Education Award from the Council on Social Work Education and was inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. So we're anxious to hear what Mimi has to say about our midterms. And next will be Luisa Lopez, the president of the Latino Social Work Coalition and Scholarship Fund and chief executive officer of Lopez and Company. She is the director of social services and communications for the Urban Outreach Center of New York City. She's an adjunct field lecturer at Columbia University School of Social Work. And her political experience includes being the director of digital media for the office of the Manhattan Borough President's Office and Chief of Staff for the New York City Council. Lisa also serves on the Board of Directors of the Social Work Democracy Project. And I guess uh, you can see that, I guess everyone here is a member of the Social Work, the Board of Directors of the Social Work Democracy Project. Uh, and next, last but not least, is Jason Ostrander, an Assistant Professor at Sacred Heart University's Department of Social Work and Director of the Congressional Policy Practice Internship. He currently serves uh, on the Research Committee and Advisory Board for the Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work, is a member of the ISP Board of Directors and serves as Director of Research for CRISP. Jason also serves on the Board of Directors uh, for the Social Work 
Democracy Project. So there are our panelists and we're gonna begin with Justin Hodge. Well, thank you, Charles, for the introduction and thank you to the panelists and for uh, hosting the open classroom and to everyone in the chat. Uh, thank you for the people in the chat for the congratulations. Really happy to be through the election season here. Uh, so Charles wanted us to speak about two or three, probably two uh, key takeaways from this last election. Uh, I wanted to focus my comments on the fantastic election, in my opinion, that we had in Michigan and what that means for states across the country and what might we be able to do to try to replicate uh, those kinds of successes. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying that Michigan has has been one of the worst gerrymandered states in the country. Jason's going to touch on this when he gives his comments. Um, but to give you some context, all of our prior to this election and after this election, all of our statewide seats have been under Democratic control. Yet we've had over the last 40 or so years uh, a state legislature that's been uh, under pretty significant Republican control. Uh, so in 2018, the voters of Michigan uh, put together a ballot initiative that gave us a nonpartisan redistricting commission. So post census, uh, we were able to use those maps for this. And as a result of this, the Democrats uh, flipped the state house and the state Senate uh, for the first time in about 40 years. Uh, I'd also throw in here that uh, in Michigan, we also have a, we, we do our elections for state Supreme Court in a pretty odd way where they appear as nonpartisan on the ballot, but they're nominated by the political parties. Uh, we have a democratic majority or justices that were nominated by the democratic party make up the majority of our state Supreme Court. So two of the, the key things that takeaways for me were one, the, the significance of gerrymandering and the importance of having a nonpartisan redistricting commission, but also the importance of ballot initiatives. So in 2018 and this year, we had really significant ballot initiatives that turned out voters uh, in, I think, in the favor of the Democrats. So in 2018, two I really want to highlight, one was the, well, actually three, one of them was the uh, ballot initiative that gave us the nonpartisan redistricting commission. There was another one that expanded voting, voting rights, uh, and a third one which uh, legalized recreational marijuana. Uh, that, I think, is one of the items that really helped Democrats significantly in 2018. Now, in 2020, we had three ballot issues again. Uh, the first one, you know, that one kind of went either way. It was around term limits for our state legislators. I don't think that one in particular turned anybody out. But um, we had one that further expanded voting rights and also had items in it to protect against election subversion uh, and voter suppression. So it's really preemptive. And then the third one, which is what really drew people out, uh, was reproductive justice. So it enshrined in the Michigan state constitution, the right to an abortion. Uh, Michigan being a pre row state and that we had a law on the books that outlawed abortion uh, created a lot of chaos in our state uh, around what after Roe versus Wade was overturned, which um, prompted ballot initiative and then lawsuits both from our governor uh, and other groups. So really what I want us to think about is the importance of ballot initiatives and how we might be able to, to replicate the successes that we saw in Michigan and many in a, a couple of other states uh, and the use of that to turn out voters uh, to vote also for elected officials that share your values. Just to give you a, uh, you know, some, a hint into some of my thinking around this is that not every state allows for ballot initiatives, only about half of the states allow for ballot initiatives. So as we think about ways that we can support and protect democracy, part of that I think is being able to expand opportunities for uh, direct democracy through ballot initiative. Uh, and, and the key thing, I think for states that are really gerrymandered like we were in Michigan, we were never gonna get into a space where our state legislature uh, was, was gonna stop engaging in gerrymandering. Like we would have continued to be one of the most gerrymandered states in the country, if not for having a nonpartisan redistricting commission. So I really see uh, states that allow for ballot initiative using that as a tool to force uh, states that are trying to not engage in fair maps as a way to do that. Uh, before I turn over to the next speaker, I also wanted to highlight, it was also a very good day for social workers in elected office in Michigan. So we elected six social workers to the state legislature. Uh, we have, you know, Debbie Stabenow, our U.S. Senator is a social worker. We also elected uh, someone to Congress as a social worker. And then we had a number of local elected uh, uh, township, city and county elected officials across uh, the state that are social workers, particularly in my county, Washtenaw County. Um, there were several city council people um, that were elected. And then um, one of our, two of our state legislators that are social workers are from Washtenaw County. 
Uh, so it was, a, it was a really good day for social workers. And I wanted to think about uh, how we can use that to springboard getting more students. A lot of what I teach on is getting students to think about seeing themselves in the policy and political space and getting them to think about running. Uh, but also, how do we get people just more involved in policy in general? Because we're having really successful social work candidates across the country. So I will leave it there. I'm looking forward to engaging in this discussion. Yes, great. Uh, Jason, um, Jason, Justin, that was amazing. Uh, hi, I am Marla Blunt Carter, um, as Charles mentioned, and um, I really love following Justin because he represents what I think one of the biggest takeaways uh, was, and that is the youth vote, and more importantly, youth engaged and involved in the political process, including running for office. Um, and so I thought about this, I had a million takeaways, um, but I wanted to have a conversation with three people in particular. And, um, and, and those three individuals are elected officials in the state of Delaware. I live in Delaware, um, as Charles said at the top of, of this um, webinar, that my sister is the Congresswoman uh, from the great state of Delaware. And um, you know, I, I wanted to speak to her and two other elected officials asking them the question, what was your big takeaway? Um, and the first person I spoke to was a social worker who is a millennial state senator who is bisexual and she's an African-American and she she made history uh, when she won her race. And so I asked her, you know, what was your big takeaway? And her focus was on the fact that we are still a divided nation, but that we need to mobilize and uh, really organize the disenfranchised voters. So, you know, I, I thought, well, yeah, that's true. But then I asked another state senator and that state senator was uh, Sarah McBride. And Sarah is the highest ranking transgender person in state government across the country. Uh, she too is a millennial, 29 years old. And when I asked Sarah the same question, she said, and, and I quote, um, that election deniers came up short. Um, and their ability to really affect the next election. Um, and she said that because, you know, secretaries of state races were key in addition to governor's races um, in protecting our democracy and making sure that election deniers um, did not play a part in, in the upcoming elections. Um, and then I asked my sister, Lisa, um, who is a congresswoman, and she was actually a congresswoman that was trapped in that gallery during the insurrection. Um, and during that time, she saw firsthand our democracy being threatened, physically threatened. Um, and so when I asked, what did this election mean to her? She said that it restored her faith in the American people, that for the last two years, she was still struggling with um, you know, what she had experienced as she was trapped and as she saw this, this threat to our democracy. And I mentioned the three of these because to me, the biggest takeaway, the three of them were the first. And there were a number of firsts this election. Uh, we had Maxwell Frost, the first Gen Z member of Congress now. We have uh, the first LGBT person of Congress representing Vermont. We have Summer Lee, the first black woman in Pennsylvania to go to Congress. Maura Healy, the first female governor of Massachusetts. Wes Moore, the first black uh, governor of Maryland. The list goes on and on. And it's not just in those key high positions, but in state chambers. And I think it's important that we really focus on what's happening on the state and local level. You know, they say that state politics is the, is the uh, laboratory for democracy. And as they are moving, those that are, are, are the threat to democracy, they're, they're, you know, their intention is to move everything to states' rights. And so if we're not in control of what's happening on the state level, then we're going to have a difficult time, um, you know, putting forth policies that really align with our values as a, as a profession. So for me, I am hopeful. And my biggest takeaway is that our country is now starting to look like, um, our government is starting to look like our country. 
and that representation matters. And so as more and more people that look like all of us run for office um, and, and are elected to office, hopefully that will encourage others to, to run themselves, but also to see that, you know what, my vote does matter um, because that person knows my experience. So that was my big takeaway is that I'm hopeful. I'm not, you know, um, concerned about our threat as much as I was before this election. I'm still concerned, but I'm hopeful. And so on to Mimi. Okay, thank you. Well, we've heard some really good news. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna say that as co-chair of the, of the Voting and Social Work, I've been worried about and talking about the mounting threats <clears throat> to democracy in, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States and abroad for some time. And it seems that I'm not alone. Threats to democracy became the number one issue facing America, Americans in August, topping cost of living. Even President Biden warned us of this threat more than once, rather forcefully. Everyone knows that voting is the most basic right in our democracy. So before I talk about my takeaways, I want to say it was not easily won. The vote was not easily won. History shows that since the 1900s, the trade union, civil rights, and women's liberation movements all played key roles. Now, given that voting rights and democracy go hand in hand, today I want to step back a bit and reflect on the outcome of the election. I want to talk about what happened and what did not happen. So my first takeaway is what happened. And this is what the media focused. The media focused on what happened, um, that voters defied the midterm odds in a stunning reversal of historic trends. Mostly Democrats protected democracy from the Republican right wing, at least for the time being. And social workers, we have reasons to celebrate. Not only we help with the positive outcomes, but there was no red wave. Thousands of voters stood on long lines for hours and voted their interests. Both parties put forward diverse candidates. There were few claims of fraud. There was little violence. Voters defeated many, if not all the election deniers, most of them, and most of them conceded. And the simmering civil war within the Republican party broke open. Trump lost power in the party, if not with the base. It felt like the authoritarian fever broke. Many said it could have been worse. Others, including me, feel that we dodged a bullet. It felt like a return to normalcy. But then again, is it and for how long? Most media rightfully reported on this good news, but too few discussed my second takeaway, what did not happen. And at the risk of dampering our mood a bit, Social workers, we need to both celebrate, but also to take a look at what did not happen. To build a successful pro-democracy strategy, we cannot assume that the US was a well-functioning democracy before Trump or before January 6th. Rather, history reveals that at least two troubling and persistent patterns reveals these must be undone. We must undo systemic racism and minority rule. So here's the story. Racism, from Reconstruction to today, each expansion of voting rights threatened white supremacy, male domination, and class power. Those benefiting from the recent status, from the racist status quo intentionally underlined, suppressed the vote, especially in communities of color. I have a whole talk on this for another time. Minority rule. The founding fathers did not design a pure democracy. They rejected majority rule, which says that only candidates who secure more than half the popular vote should win. Instead, they accepted minority rule, which allows candidates who fail to win the majority to take office. Minority rule, which insulates such officials from the, the voice of the people, is embedded in the electoral college, gerrymandering, the filibuster, and the Supreme Court. Let me briefly explain. The Electoral College supports minority rule by allowing presidential candidates to win office while losing the popular vote. Now, only three presidents lost the popular vote between 1824 and 2000, all before 1890. But since 2000, two of the past four presidents, Bush and Trump, did so. 
And it's been projected that by 2024, it was not a projection, it will have been 20 years since the Republican president won the popular vote, ensuring that they will rely even more heavily on voter suppression as we go forward. Gerrymandering. Since 1812, after each 10-year census, legislators have manipulated district maps to favor one political party or population group. And Justin talked about this, and I think Jason is going to also. Based on the 2020 census, the Republicans gerrymandered their 22, 2022 victories. They won more districts than their numbers merited because they didn't win the popular vote. They disenfranchised scores of persons of colors and upheld both racism and minority rule. The filibuster is a Senate rule that prevents senators representing the majority of Americans from passing popular bills. Then there is the Supreme Court. The decisions of this unelected and increasingly conservative body are undermining our democratic rights. They gutted the Voting Rights Acts in 2013, and permitted unfettered political gerrymandering in 2019, denied women's reproductive rights in 2022, and are poised to rule for gun violence and against affirmative action, marriage equality, climate change, and many other important rights. Then in 2022, the election meddlers and deniers found ways to stack the deck. The meddlers changed the rules to put partisan political actors in charge of their own election. As of July, they introduced 244 bills in 36 states that allowed state legislators to politicize, criminalize, and subvert elections. And have you heard about Bannon's, Steve Bannon's precinct strategy? He fueled the flames. He sends neophytes uh, to city council, school boards, state legislatures, and the polls to oversee voting and challenge the ballot. He too understands that everything is local. Then there is the independent state theory, which I'm just learning about, that gives state legislators nearly unchecked authority to challenge and even override election outcomes and set election rules at odds with state constitutions. The Supreme Court has expressed interest in this fringe theory. The election deniers, those who refuse to accept defeat, also threaten democracy. The good news is most deniers lost in, this, in uh, 2022. The bad news is in red states, many MAGA Republican governors, secretaries, and state and local officials cruise to victory, especially below the top levels. The election deniers and the meddlers were set back, for sure, but temporarily. However, they are unlikely to give up. At least that's what we have to worry about. Trump is weakened, but Trumpism is not dead. The anti-democracy pro-autocracy movement will do its best not to repeat the 2022 failures. It promises to be a threat into 2024 and beyond. And it's not just the vote. They have also attacked other democratic institutions. We are banning books in the United States. Can you believe this? The press is more corporate owned and less independent. Trust in government has fallen to an all time low. The country sadly remains deeply divided among red and blue lines with very incompatible visions of what the country should be. Coming to the end. All this raises the scary question, can democracies die? In their book, How Democracies Die, two political scientists identify four warning signs of democracies in trouble. Nearly all have been evident in the US over the past years. They conclude, democracy does not necessarily end with a bang, a violent military revolution, or by a coup. Rather, it ends with a whimper, the slow, steady weakening of critical institutions that eventually become so normalized and so taken for granted that it's difficult to detect. No alarm is sound, too few people do anything. So social workers, we can and must send that alarm. We cannot go back to business as usual. We must be both hopeful and vigilant. Democracy cannot be taken for granted. On to our next speaker. 
Thank you, Mimi. Thank you so much. Uh, glad to be here with everybody. As Charles said, my name is Luisa Lopez. And my two takeaways are really going to focus on the impact of the Latino vote on this election, and specifically what this means for social workers working in marginalized communities like the ones that, that, I've, that I have found myself as a social worker on the ground um, all these years. Um, you know, we've heard it all before. Latinos are not a monolith. And there is not a one size fits all narrative about Latinos that is evident in this election and in, in, in some of the previous elections as well. Uh, Dem Democrats are saying that Latinos uh, are, have helped beat back the red wave. And the GOP is saying that even though they didn't get the gains they were hoping for, they maintain the momentum in the Latino community and the support that they got from Latinos in, in 2020. Uh, and that they even gained support in some, in some races, uh, especially for Republican Latino candidates up and down state ballots, uh, which casts a really confusing net around what actually happened. Uh, there are some polls that indicate that this election was consistent with Latino voting patterns of the past, with almost two thirds of Latinos supporting uh, Democrats and one third supporting Republicans. And on the Republican side, uh, exit polls uh, indicate that the Latinos vote split between Democrats and Republicans uh, was something like 60-40, which is better than the numbers that that um, Trump had in 2020. Um, and, and are saying that Latinos provide an asset for the GOP. And I think that it would be wise to accept neither of these sentiments as, as wrong. But I also think that they may not be entirely right and the data is actually pointing in several different directions as to what is happening here. And this confusion about whether Latinos are red or blue can be traced back to how these votes are being counted to begin with. But I think the deeper story exists in what either party perceives to be Latino issues and how they're choosing to engage with this population. A record number of Latinos won seats um, in the House this year, I think maybe as many as 42. And most of them are Democrats, including a number of firsts. We have um, Gregorio Casar, uh, he's a 33-year-old Mexican-American and will be the first ever Latino to represent uh, to represent Austin. Um, uh, Marla, I think you mentioned uh, Maxwell Frost. He's 25 years old, Afro-Cuban from, from Orlando, the first ever Gen Z member of Congress. Very exciting. Uh, you have Robert Garcia, 44-year-old Peruvian-American mayor in Long Beach. He's going to be the first ever LGBTQ immigrant in Congress. Uh, and we have Delia Ramirez, a Guatemalan American from Chicago. She's going to be the first ever Latina member of Congress from the Midwest. These are pop. These are areas where Latinos did not have a stronghold as far back as 10 years ago. And now we're winning seats in Congress. Spread across the country, this demonstrates a, 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 a wide array of different ethnic backgrounds that really represent, at least to me, the expansion of Latino politics in this country, which muddles the water a lot as to what it is that Latinos uh, find to be important when they're voting. But before we get excited, uh, we have to compare that uh, to the close results uh, in other parts of the country. What happened in Florida, in Florida was an unmitigated disaster for the Democratic Party. Uh, DeSantis uh, won the Latino wrote, vote outright. Uh, not only among uh, anti-communists, uh, he won 68% of the Cuban vote, but also 55% of the Puerto Rican vote uh, and 50% of votes from other Latinos from other, from other um, demographics. Uh, he's the first Republican in, in decades to win Miami-Dade. And, and Florida, I was just saying to somebody this morning, Florida is no longer purple. Florida is very decidedly a red state. Um, and we know that now we know that Republicans have ended up winning the House, it's pretty much due in part to Latina Republicans from Florida. Latino Republicans from Florida. We have uh, Anna Paulina Luna, who won the seat that was vacated by, by Charlie Crist. Uh, and across the country, this uh, progression continues in Wisconsin and Arizona. Uh, Republicans seem to have done, done just a little bit better among Latinos than they did in 2020. Um, I don't want to talk about Georgia because I get all depressed. <laughs> 
But uh, Senator Warnock lost a lot of support among Latinos relative to both his and, and, and Biden's support in 2020. And, and in LA, now we know uh, that uh, it came close. Uh, Karen Bass won, and she's a social worker, but it was very, very close between her and, and, and the billionaire Rick uh, uh, Caruso. Um, so these results really indicate how blurry this picture of, of who Latinos vote for and who Latinos are is. Um, and, and that's a good thing, because that means that both uh, the GOP and the Democratic Party then have to do more. It has to be acknowledged that they have to do more to win Latino votes. Um, and, and to learn more about Latinos, not just as Republicans or Democrats, but as, as a growing group of Americans. Um, Democrats can no longer claim that Latinos by and large support progressive policies. Um, and that includes reproductive rights and the cost of health care and climate change and gun safety. These are issues that deeply divide the Latino population. So that's my first takeaway. My second takeaway is what this means for social workers and the communities that we serve. Um, even though my, my engagement with this work um, has been very much around the electoral process and policy work, I still spend a lot of time um, engaging with folks in marginalized communities and communities of color on the ground. And every day, what I see is a lack of agreement on what direction we as a country should be taking when it comes to issues of the economy, of access to health care, of education, of crime, of immigration. Um, some of the most, here in New York City, some of the most underserved, under-resourced communities are Black and Brown communities. And even those uh, that would paint our vote with a wide brush, um, I think it would be a mistake to do so because the challenges that are in these communities at the, at the, at the, at these communities, uh, they're structural and they're structural at the state level and they can only be addressed fully by engaging in the civic process at the state level. And, you know, right now everybody's breathing a sigh of relief about the red wave that has been averted. Um, I think that rejoicing about this should be restrained at best. Um, there are still very serious threats to, to democracy. Mimi, you elaborated on them um, really well. And, and the GOP is retaining control of the House. And I think it's too much to hope that the hardliners are going to, that are the hardliners that dominate the party are going to all of a sudden have a desire to work across the aisle. That's not gonna happen. Um, and, and, and I think that it's fair to say that we can hope for very little by the way, in the way of, of, of progressive legislation coming out of the national government in the next two years. So any, any structural changes to what's going on in our communities is really gonna happen at the state level and social workers engaging at that level it's, is what's gonna turn the tide in my opinion. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work to do. I could, we can all breathe a sigh of relief, but that needs to be followed up with action, with organized action on behalf of social workers and on behalf of the communities that we serve in order to fully um, uh, stem the tide of some really scary things that are coming down the pike. Passing it on to Jason. Hi, thank you everybody. Um, I'm a visual person, so I did a very small PowerPoint just so you can see what I'm talking about. So bear with me for a second. Oop, flip it. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about gerrymandering. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh Georgia. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about gerrymandering because I've been paying a lot of attention to it since the the census was completed and the narrative that has been taking place as it relates to gerrymandering. Um and it actually comes up in a lot of classes that I teach, you know, how can this be allowed to happen? How could this, um, how can, you know, it be so lopsided when so many, you know, people have come out, especially in a midterm. And so I always pick on Texas, sorry, Texas, but um, I think it's an, e an easy target. And so um, one of the first things that I think of when I start looking at um, how, these races um, turned out after the midterms is I look at the margin. I look at the margin because it tells me what the overvote is in each of these districts. 
how many of a certain party are being crammed into uh, packed into these districts um, so that a particular candidate can be elected. And in Texas, um, you, you can look at all 38 seats and you can see amongst Democrats and Republicans, there is no small difference. They are all being packed into more red districts, being packed into more blue districts. Um, and I think we have to also understand, you know, Texas's map was sued. It was held until after the election. I mean, the result of their map of these 38 seats where they gained two seats, only 10 of the districts are majority Hispanic. One is a plurality of black voters, the congressional 30th uh, congressional district, not even a majority black district exists. Um, two are, pl uh, are also plurality Hispanic. Again, they don't represent a majority, but they represent many of the voters in the district by um, by uh, race ethnicity. And there are no Asian American um, plurality districts in Texas. So 13 out of 38 districts are are where uh, folks of color can actually hope to elect somebody that looks like them. All the rest are um, in districts where the white population makes up either the plurality or the majority. Um, so when we're looking at these districts, uh, these conversations I keep having with my students, I really do believe um, it does boil down to gerrymandering. It's politicians picking their voters. Um, and both Democrats and Republicans do a really great job at this, especially in many states. Um, but I want us just to keep in mind this margin because I'm going to come back to it. So when we're looking at Texas from this last cycle, on the left is the old map, on the right is the new map. Um, there was federal court action involved in the old map. So not all the districts were changed. Some were changed based on the Voting Rights Act. Um, and there have been really no changes um, in this current map. And I think that you can you can tell just by visually looking at it, the seats are not as, as contiguous. They're more spread out, especially when we're looking at uh, urban and rural. And so anybody who knows anything about redistricting, we know we talk about cracking and packing. Uh, cracking is trying to split um, one party's power over... Um, the uh, district uh, by trying to extend it out into, for example, I'm actually in a second going to go to Austin, by extending out and packing more people from the other party, or they try to pack uh, a, a large number of them together so they have less of an influence on seats that would be, for example, outside of an urban area. So this is this is the left is the old map, right is the new map. And I think that you can see even that blue district on the left-hand side does a little snaky down the highway all the way to San Antonio. Um, and in the left, you can see where they really cracked Austin. They took the uh, populations from Austin and they spread it out into conservative areas um, to try to dilute Austin's very high level of, Demo of Democratic Party engagement from impacting congressional seats. But then when you look over on the right side, the actual, the redistricting this time has been commented in the New York Times and others that they actually just tried to shore up their members. So they packed a lot of Democrats into fewer districts so that they would have less impact on um, some, of these, uh, some of these members. So if you see, now Austin is represented by two members of Congress, where before it was three, um, and it's because they've really uh, uh, packed in the voters into the district so it doesn't have an influence on others. And I just use, again, Texas as an example. I think one of the things that we have to go back to when we're thinking of these margins, um, I know there was a Supreme Court case a while ago that you know talked about this. Um, mathematical way of establishing what a good range would be for um, an over under vote. And I believe it was like five um, plus or minus five. And um, I think this is part my I think there's others out there that agree with this, but just in my head and talking with my students, I think this is part of the dysfunction that we're having. So when you have districts that are so overly represented by people of their own party, there is no incentive to work together, to compromise, to, um, 
to try to come up with ways that um, are not going to solely benefit one party or the other. When I have, for example, in the first congressional district in Texas, when I know I have a plus 56, I only have to worry about my primary. I don't have to worry about the general election. All I have to do is make sure that I represent as close to the fringe as possible because that is who's going to cha challenge me. That is who's going to who's going to run against me. That is going to be the person that I have to worry about. A Democrat would never win. The same thing with the Democrats. I mean, look at, you know, um, any of them, the 20th with Castro and San Antonio or Fletcher in the 20 in the seventh. Um, they are so democratic that, again, they have to appeal to their base. They have to appeal to the left wing of the party um, in order to not have a primary opponent. Um, so there is no incentive in any of these districts to work with somebody in the other party. And then I want to just talk about um, this notion also before we go to Georgia, is I think what Justin ta uh, mentioned around uh, Michigan having a nonpartisan um, a nonpartisan redistricting commission, I think is showing um, in the results. So there are seven of them across the country. Um, and when you look at the districts that are created in those states, they're contiguous, they have similar interests, they have similar cultures. Um, and they look like districts that are where the challenges are. So look at California and many of the districts is an independent redistricting committee. They did not take into account where any member of Congress lived. It did not matter. It was trying to keep districts that were contiguous, had similarities, had uh, met the requirements of state and federal law. And so you had many members having to move to uh, 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 run in different uh, races, and many of those races are actually much closer than anybody suspected this this time around, which means that they have to engage with people from the other party. They have to listen. They have to care if they want to keep their job. Um, the same thing is true in Arizona, um, as Justin said, Michigan, um, very true in Colorado, where they gained a seat. Um, so I think that is one potential solution. Um, a, a, a not a solution is what's going on in the state of Ohio. Sorry for those in the state of Ohio. It is a partisan uh, redistricting process that is very complex. Um, the, the Ohio Supreme Court, um, this is also partially true for North Carolina, the Ohio Supreme Court has ruled down, last I counted, four uh, maps. Um, because they found that they didn't meet the spirit of a constitutional amendment that was passed in Ohio. Um, it, what is going to be interesting now is the Supreme Court in Ohio is now majority Republican. So it'll be interesting to see how the, that case plays out and how it will change. Um, because in the prior, prior to this election, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, um, I, I'm forgetting the woman's name, and that's unfortunate. She was retiring, but she was a swing vote that kept striking down with the Democrats, what they were trying to do. I think the same thing can be seen in North Carolina. Um, it was the state Supreme Court that was trying to be the balance on interpreting their, con their constitution and trying to make sure that fair districts were created, not favoring one party over the other. And the Supreme Court in North Carolina is now overwhelmingly six to three Republican. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how going forward those cases in uh, North Carolina play out. Um, and then, uh, yes, I want to go to Georgia. I spent a lot of time thinking about Georgia because I um, Stacey Abrams uh, ran once before. She was very close to beating Kemp. And um, we know from, at least I know from news sources and in her interviews that she spent a lot of time and energy all the way up in basically this last 10 years um, trying to register more, uh, more folks to vote, especially Black folk to vote in Georgia, um, to really start changing the dynamic in the state, which is very, very much Republican. And um, a couple of the things that I realized in watching this race um, initially was, you know, Kemp did a great job in nationalizing the race. He made it against Biden and his policies and not a, a, a 
Stacey didn't prevent it from being a local a local race narrative. Um, her real one Georgia message didn't really land. And I think we can really see that, which is part of what is really interesting to me in this race and concerning is that she kind of didn't resonate with rural white voters. And yes, we can say, you know, part of it could be because she's black. Part of it could be because she's a white woman running for governor in a state. Um, we could come up with a whole list of reasons why that is. But when you look at the data on the on the screen and you look at sex by race, only 27 percent of white women voted for her. In an election where she was trying to make the narrative around abortion and abortion rights, um, and only 23% of white men did. Um, so it, it really shows that whatever that message was and whatever those barriers were, they just were not benefiting her. I mean, Kemp was also um, running for re-election, so he had the incumbency factor that really does help him um, in the race. Uh, we know that in uh, after the last race, the Senate, uh, the Georgia Republicans passed, you know, Senate Bill 202, which made voting much stricter, much harder to do. Some even say that it's it's suppressed some of the um, folks of color from voting um, based on that bill. Yes, part of that could also also be the also be the case, but I think somehow understanding why white women unlike the others in their um and by gender um who voted in that state did not like her message and did not uh vote for her it's just really interesting to me so i throw that out there and i am done charles Oh, thank you. Thank everyone for your very insightful comments and observations. I want to pick up on something that uh, Mimi said and and Louisa kind of alluded to in her in her uh, presentation. You said that it can't be business as usual for social workers. Now, if Nancy Humphreys was here, she would say it's time to take it to the streets. But uh, what, so can you briefly uh, uh, elaborate on what do you mean that is, it can't be business as usual for social workers? Maybe. And then, and then others can chime in if you have any thoughts on that too. Um, well, I, I guess for me, when, the, uh, when I was watching the returns and the next day everyone was saying, um, no red wave, phew, it's a relief, it could have been worse. I was just worried that one option, and hopefully it won't happen, but I, my talk was to warn against it as an option, that it might happen that we and other people will be so relieved that we'll go back to business as usual. Um, that we'll think, okay, you know, we dodged a bullet so we can just go along. And so business as usual means not, not organizing, not fighting back, not paying attention to the, the forces that are trying to undermine democracy. Um, that's what I mean by business. We have to keep up the good fight. And, and so you worry sometimes that when good things happen, you say, phew, and, I'm ex and everyone's exhausted. And uh, oh, yeah. So that's what I meant. I so, so on a grade of one to five, how would you rate social works uh, performance? Me, I, I, I don't know. I have enough of an overview to rate social okay. work. I just I can I... say that our campaign, the power of three and voting is social work, made a hell of an effort to take advantage of social work's position between the individual and society. And through this campaign, we were well positioned to organize students, faculties, and uh, service users. And so I think that um, we, we did all that we can with very little resources. And um, we, we, we believe we made a contribution. We believe we made a contribution in prior elections, but it's difficult to tabulate it because our, our strategy is working through other organizations who work to re reach out to their constituency. So it's really hard to get an accurate count, but um, we know we made a difference. So, um, and I wanna hear you know, others speak about where we are and particularly Louisa, because you you said that uh, Warnock was losing Latino votes. Um, what 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 
you know, what was causing that? So what were you thinking about that? You're on mute. You would think after all this time. <laughs> I want to say something first about the the business as as usual, because okay. I think that not enough. I don't hear enough in our profession about engaging voters and engaging our clients and engaging the communities that we work in and live in around issues. Issues don't just come out of nowhere. Lack of affordable housing is not just a thing that happens. You know, uh, food insecurity, poverty alleviation, bail reform. These are not just things that fall out of the sky. Somebody wrote legislation, somebody got data, somebody presented legislation at the at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, and decided that they were going to vote for one thing over the other. And something that's personally frustrating for me is engaging with, with my community and people just sort of saying, well, this is how it is. You know, this is who I'm going to vote for because they've been around since the flood and this is just what it is. And not really not encouraging the people that we work with in community to think critically about these issues in a way that they they understand where these policies come from and why an elected official um, or a representative might vote for something over the other. Um, so business as usual is that whew, we averted the crisis. We can all just go back to doing our case notes and doing you know, what, what we do as social workers and not really seeing where the gaps are in the community. And whatever the population is that you that you work with, engaging that population in why things are the way they are and what can we do, what are empowering people, reminding them that they have that power as, as voters uh, to, to do something about it. Um, I don't know, Justin, if you had a, a follow-up to that. I did, thank you. Uh, so my thinking on it is around, we need to change what we think of as business as usual because business as usual needs to become constant organizing and continuing to push issues forward. I think back to uh, the Obama administration where after the huge successes there, you know, a lot of people decided, all right, we fixed everything. We're good to go. No more racism. Let's just chill. And then we saw how that turned out for us. I'm fearful based on the, the great successes uh, and progress that we just saw in Michigan after the last election that we might see something similar that people think, OK, well, we have fair match now. We're just going to be able to keep winning elections. And that's not that's not the takeaway I get from uh, the election in Michigan and many of the other states where I think ballot initiatives really drove turnout. I think the message to take from it is that in, in Michigan demonstrates this and other states do do too in 2018 and in 2020 and you know in 2022, what we see is we need to organize around an issue and that brings voters out. If legislators are not legislating on issues that the majority of the population think is very important, then the organizing needs to happen and it needs to go on the ballot and that's gonna drive more people out to vote. I even think about in 2018, uh, around the recreational marijuana ballot initiative, there was jockeying by the Republicans to try to make it not be Prop 1. Like they wanted it to be the lowest number of proposition because of ballot fatigue and hoping that people would just, it would drop off and people wouldn't vote for it and that that would hurt turnout. It didn't and it still drove turnout. So I think the continuing to organize around whatever the issue is or finding a new thing. Right. Like what is the now that Michigan is in a much better space around voting rights um, from the and combating in a preemptive way election subversion. I think we need to continue organizing around voting rights. And I and hopefully um, we'll see another ballot initiative that protects voting rights even further. And whatever other issue, I'd like to see something about the affordable housing crisis end up being a, a ballot initiative in Michigan, since that's something we're struggling with. Okay, so I mean, I think one other thing that I want to take away just also listening to the great conversation going on is that, I mean, and I, I maybe Louisa won't agree with me, but I think what we do is an election comes around and that's when we start caring. We are not organizing or having parties or infrastructure that's organizing year round that is really 
talking to voters, asking them to continue to par- participate. We forget about them until, you know, just before the election starts and then we start talking to them again. I mean, I think, I mean, social workers do this. We need to get into good old fashioned organizing again, staying engaged in communities, really engaging people we work with, our clients in this as a year round process. And I think instead of parties, you know, withdrawing their money when an election is not there or anybody else, we should set up organizations and have organizations that are doing this year round. We should be registering the people to vote regardless of how you're gonna vote year round. We should be engaging in these communities, listening and trying to turn their concerns into action year round. And there are organizations doing that. And we, I, I don't wanna say we, that we, I'm going to say we social work needs to think of our process differently. It's it's more than, you know, just when elections come up, we're going to put organizers on ground in states to help try to help if the money is there. I think if we really feel strongly about this process and really um, trying to make change, then we should find the money. We should find the way to make this a concerted effort and to put some best practices in the place to make these changes. Okay, so. Uh, we're all in, well, you guys are all in academia. Uh, are we are we constrained by the need to be nonpartisan? Marla? So I'm not. Um, but but I, I I think that the re the way that I teach, the way that I am not um speaking in a partisan fashion is that um, I align my teaching with our values. And so our values are partisan, (laughs) but I'm just speaking our values. Um, You know, I wanted to, uh, the comments are are just saying so much. And and Mimi, I, I brought community organizing back on the ground at Rutgers uh, mm-hmm. last year. It was fully online. I don't know how you organize online, but you know, I agree with you 100%. We're not training social workers uh, how to organize. Um, and, 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 and that speaks to our profession. We don't value it. But, then, but yet we want to see the effects and the benefits of organizing. So I, I agree. I think that it, it, we, we need to elevate that. And we do need to be doing this 24-7. We have 24 months until the next election. And as Jason said, you know, we're all breathing a sigh of relief, but I think that there are many organizations that we we all need to be joining and becoming a part of. I know right before this, this call, I joined, uh, I think it's called ACASA, the Association for Community Organizing and Social Action. Paid my 40 bucks, joined it. I join any organization where there are social workers because I think it's important that we are a part of a collective. We know the power of organizing. We know that if we all move together, you know, politicians vote where numbers are. <laughs> I mean, that 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 that's it's just simple math. So I I think you know as far as getting ready for the next election, I think we need to we really just need to join our organizations, support our organizations, and make them work for us because they're all there. We're just not utilizing them in the right way. So yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna. I'm gonna throw out a, a couple more questions, uh, but we really would like to get some questions from our uh, viewers, our, our audience. So please, if you have if you have a question for any particular panelist or just a general question, uh, could you put it in the uh, chat box? Yes, Mom. Charles. Can I can I just say real quickly? You know, I just wanted to comment on Jason's. Um, on his presentation and, you know, the the fact that the the statistics uh, that Jason found them interesting, that the white vote did not break um, in the direction of Stacey Abrams. And, you know, just being totally honest, um, it was racism. And, and, you know, I, I, I really wish that we could have that discussion as we talk about politics, that um, we are really fighting against white supremacy. And that is an issue that we need not tiptoe around if we're really going to address these problems of of threats to democracy. That's the true threat, is white supremacy. 
So that then, okay, Jason, you can respond. I just want to say, I truly believe that, but I was just giving a broader picture of what I think. I really do think it comes down that she was a black woman and, and they weren't going to vote for her because she was a black woman. Um, but there are other things in play that I, I wanted to mention just so those were out there as well. So for me, the goal is a functioning multiracial society. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but it means that we all can function in this society, uh, you know, at, to the best of our, you know, our uh, potential. And so how, how does social work help move us in that direction? Louisa, any thoughts? <laughs> You know I'm going to call it. That's a really big question. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very ambitious goal and a very big question. But um, if we don't, if we, if we're not moving in that direction, you know, are, are we, are we going anywhere at all? Well, I think, and Marla, jump in here. Um, I think that you nailed it on the head about our values, and and our code of ethics, really. Our values and our code of ethics is pointing us towards that society. And it's putting those things in action that is proving to be difficult. Um, why it is proving to be difficult? I think it is because of things like white supremacy and 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 patriarchy and these these norms that we that we live under, um, and making that leap to to organizing ourselves and encouraging folks to live uh, with, with our values is really, really hard. Um, so I don't have an answer, yeah. uh, but I, I think that that is the root of a problem. And also we're, you know, the, 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 the fact that we have to be bipartisan makes it really hard to, to um, encourage people to, to see things um, the way that our code of ethics sh tells us things should be. Maybe. Yeah, two things. Um, first, uh, Terry's comment in the chat, she answers your question, Charles, to, begins to answer it about what can social works do? And she points to the work of the Special Commission to Advance Macro Social Work and how, and I'm a commissioner with, with that organization, and how we have been changing the infrastructure of social work to encourage, promote, and uphold macro practice. So the more mac, it's not that micro practitioners can't do this, but macro practitioners have been, um, as I said in my comment, uh, sort of diminished by the loss of community organizing, which is what I trained in when I was a, in the master's program. And um, so if we don't have, if we don't train organizers, we can't organize enough and we can't leave it to the few people who are advocates by training or spirit. So that, and I think that's one thing. So one thing we can do is to, you know, support community organizing and other forms of macro practice, and you know, and maybe people can do more to help that effort, which has really made a lot of progress in the past five years. The second thing is, <clears throat> why do people don't vote their interests? Okay, I mean, we've kind of been talking about that. And, um, and why do they even maybe vote against their own values, whether it's religion or social values? Um, I think that, I mean, one of the things I do, I teach social policy and I, I'm always focusing on the structural analysis of what's going on in our society. That's that's what I think about a lot. And I think the things I mentioned in my talk, four structures of the electoral policy uh, process help explain um, uh, why the votes voting process is stacked against the outcomes that we want. And the Republican Party has done much more to in, entrench those things, strengthen them, um, while the Democratic Party um, has done less. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not embedded in those parties to know enough. Maybe some of you can, and that I'm, maybe I'm wrong about the Democratic Party, but it seems to me the Republicans have been very brilliant about taking over the Supreme Court, this, the secretaries of state, and Steve Bannon's precinct strategy. So we have our work cut out for us. And so, and I don't, I don't mean social work, I mean only social work. We're a little drop in the bucket compared to all the forces swirling around us, but we can make a big, we can make a difference. They put our shoulder to the wheel. But 
we, I think social workers have to do a better job upping our ante in understanding um, how society is structured and how that's working against what we're trying to accomplish. I could talk for hours about that, but I think we're running out of time. <laughs> I think Daniel has joined us. Uh, do you have you found, is there a pressing question uh, from our audience? Yeah, we've had actually quite a few throughout the time. So I'd love to throw a few of those out there and, uh, and engage the audience. So I'll start first with um, a question about how to get uh, how to get people out to vote. So how do we get the non-voters who, who are eligible to vote to the polls? There are so many folks who, who can vote and don't, and a great majority of those non-voters are from oppressed and intentionally under-resourced communities. So anyone want to talk about some of those strategies to, to get more people to vote? I just want to ask a question about that. Is it that they don't, they don't come out to vote or they're blocked from voting? And I think our strategy has to depend on how we answer that question. We always assume that they're lazy voters, but, but so, so many things block them from voting and all, all the things that have been made voting easier are being taken away. So I think I, we would be careful how we answer this question so we don't end up blaming the victim. I, I, I watched the uh, webinar yesterday uh, by nonprofit vote on, on, on youth vote. And it was really interesting. And, and what is, they said that the reason the youth vote is not uh, as high as it could be is because they they aren't registered, and that they have that their 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 the efforts to register them usually don't take place until we get close to elections, and that if we made a a a, a, a a more concerted effort to register young people or even have them, uh, you know, that there, there are states where they have uh, automatic registration if you apply for a license or something like that. So I think if we want more young people to vote, I think we need to target them in terms of getting them registered. Jason. I just wanted to quickly say that I believe Addie Sandler her dissertation was trying to understand voting amongst community college students who are on means tested program. And she, from her work, you know, identified four different types of voters. And one of them was people who know the system really well and just refuse to vote, refuse to participate in the system. But I think you can go into, she published with Shannon uh, Lane, who I know that's on this, um, on some of that work and identifying the four types of voters. And I think that also offers some kind of under better understanding of why people do or don't engage. So I think when we start to understand that, then we can think of different ways to intervene with them um, and to try to overcome some of those barriers. Yeah. And they said that the that the young people who are registered to vote vote in the numbers that you know that that other um, uh, age groups do. Once they're registered, they will vote. Yes, Jesse. Thanks, Charles. So, uh, as Mimi was mentioning, I think it's going to take a you know a state by state strategy because we don't have a you know, a system at the federal level. Marlo, I really like that comment. Uh, we don't have nationwide voter um, automatic voter registration, and then you know voter suppression laws differ across the country. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking of this example in you know, over the last election uh, on U of M's campus. We the campus worked with the city of Ann Arbor to have satellite voting sites uh, to make it easier for students to vote. Uh, one of them was at uh, like really on central campus and the lines were so long that the person that was got in line at 8 p.m. when polls closed but got in line then didn't vote until 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. Now there were people that were going and taking food and drinks to the student, the many, many students that were in line waiting for hours. You can't do that in Georgia though, right? Because all that differs depending on what state you're in. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, kids in high school as they're approaching 18 are not registered to vote. We need to have some sort of strategy where we're getting into the into high schools. Some states have pre-registration. If we don't have these things, we need to advocate for those kinds of policy changes so we can get into those spaces and get people registered to vote. So it's tough because it's going to really differ depending on what state you're in. Uh, what are the barriers to voting? Uh, or even the barriers to getting people registered to vote. And then 
that alone, then getting over that hurdle to figure out how do you get people out to be able to vote. So it's not a not an easy question. It's like a 50 different answer kind of question. Okay, Daniel, is there any other? Yeah, there's there's plenty and, and audience. Well, Marla has her hand up. The, uh, I'm sorry. We're not getting good uh, use of the raise <laughs> hand button here. So. Oh, I didn't see that. I tell you, Marla, I might not see that. No, the raise hand. Okay. I, you know, I just wanted to echo um, what Justin said that, you know, we're trained to not overgeneralize. And we can't say, you know, voters or individuals that are not voting, we need to do this or that. It definitely needs to be a 50 state strategy. But even in um, in Shannon and in, in um, Addie Sandler's article, they talk about empowerment, right? And so when I spoke with my 18 year old daughter who voted this, this past election, uh, right before this call, she said that that election made her realize that her vote mattered and that we don't need to underestimate the power of our vote. And so I think that, you know, that empowerment is, is critical in, in helping uh, the, the youth vote, but also those that are disenfranchised to really understand that, that they have that kind of power. And I don't think we're really good about messaging that. We kind of buy into the narrative that one vote doesn't count and that hurts, that hurts us. You know, so so I, I think that 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 is uh, really important. But I wanted to quickly say something, um, Charles, about your question about a multiracial social work uh, or multiracial society. And back to my answer about my biggest takeaway. You know what I mean? It, the individuals that got, that got elected look like everybody. I mean, the list is unbelievable. When we talk about the first Muslim woman elected to the state Senate in Georgia, I mean, you would not believe some of the first that represent the diversity. And that is the only way that we're going to see more and more people get involved and engaged is if we're able to articulate the fact that you are invited to the party, y'all. You know, this is not their party. And I don't mean... Democrat or Republican, I'm talking about the political process. We have to communicate that, and the best way to communicate that is through representation. Yeah, if that translates into uh, addressing some of the disparities. I mean, no, just getting them elected is, does not necessarily, there's a, there's no, a, you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mimi, Mimi had a hand up, and, and uh, um, go, but, I guess I was going to say that. Um, we are a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society. We are that if you look at the demographics that you all showed on your charts. The problem is that some people, the white supremacists and their allies don't like that. And they don't like that uh, people of color and women are and others are gaining power of the kind that Marla is describing. So remember that we will replace you. Remember the white supremacists, all that stuff. So social workers, we can't just say we got to do all these good things. It makes me very frustrated. We have to take on the bad things. And, and so we, ha and we have to figure out ways to do that. And so we have to focus on the problems as well as the solutions. And the, the problems are the polarization, but it's not the polarization. It's what's causing the polarization. The po causing the polarization, two quick things I'll say, and there's much more. One is that some of the white grievance is validated because they, the white working class has been um, underserved and, and suffering inequality and, and reduced longevity. There's no doubt about it. They have a grievance, but, but why is it being answered the way it is? We have to, we, whoever we is, have to do a better job of, of making society more equal, fair, and just. We would have less polarization if that happened. And then we have to a society has to do a better job of countering the racist myths that are around. And it's starting to happen. I do see since George Floyd, there's been a lot of reckoning and a lot happening, but it's, um, I'm not sure that the social work community has put its shoulder to the wheel enough. A lot has been done. I have to give credit to that, but not enough has been done. So we just can't say, it makes me crazy to say we must do this, we must do that, when we don't also talk about taking down the barriers that are stopping us from accomplishing those goals. Thank you for sharing, Mimi. And audience, thank you so much for all these great questions. We're not going to be able to get to every single one, but we'll get to as many as we can here in the last few minutes. So my next question uh, is uh, a student put this in the chat, a current MSW student said, 
Um, are there any forums or resources that can inform students who are interested in political office? I think uh, hearing hearing uh, Marla talk about um, you know seeing um, the, the true diversity that, that to, to represent. Uh, how do we get young people engaged in politics? So, Jason, I'm just doing some shout out. So of course, um, Chris, we're going to start having um, the uh, summer. Uh, summer institute again um so that's one way in which to uh to start the process of learning about um how to engage in this i mean at the yukon um camp at the humphreys institute at the, uh, um, they do the campaign school every year i know shannon and tanya are going to be angry because i can't remember what number it is 25th 26th 25th. Um, and so that normally happens in, well, generally right before my spring break. So um, it's probably somewhere at the end of, oh, Tanya, Tanya wrote 24th and 20, uh, 25th is also another way. But there are also others across the country um, that are taking place. Um, so be on the lookout. But those are the two that I would say most immediate and are for social workers, uh, folks can participate in. Yeah, and we do a student advocacy day on- uh, Oh yeah, day, about that. Uh, 2023 and uh, Luisa Lopez will be uh, helping us to coordinate that. And uh, she'll help you get, your, uh, get you in that right direction. All right, so we're, 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 we're in the running. chat too. Uh, another, it's another one. Our online certificate in political social work. Uh, that you know, it's an asynchronous, largely asynchronous program. Um, wide variety of tools you can learn there. And I think our team from the continuing education office is on the call, so I know I'd get in trouble if I didn't take the opportunity to plug that. So uh, take a look. Oh, oh there, you go. Leah put it in there too. Thank you, Leah. Okay, listen, we're running. We're running out of time. I would like to give every one of our, each of our panelists an opportunity to make a. Uh, nine, a brief uh, closing statement uh, about uh, just your thoughts about what we've talked about today. We didn't get a chance to talk about Karen Bass becoming the uh, mayor of Los Angeles. There's so many things that we wanted to talk about, but we, you know, we only had uh, 90 minutes, and I thought it'd be it went pretty fast. So we're going to go in reverse order. I'm going to ask Jason uh, and then uh, uh, Louisa, uh, Mimi. Marla and Justin. Um, I guess mine is going to go back to one of the uh, comments that I said, which is, uh, I think that we got to get social work. Yes, you can specialize in any practice that you want, but we got to get programs and people back engaged in community. Community is the key to this um, and really engaging with community and helping people to believe that their voice has power, their actions have power so that we can start um, changing some of the things that we're seeing, especially at the local level. I mean, I tell my students all the time, what's really going to impact your pocket the most is what's going on in your town, city, or in your state. And so we really need them to show up and to be present and to get the people who we work with to show up and be present. And so it's going to take organizing. It's going to take individual conversations, working in community, working with these organizations to bring about change. Lisa? Uh, piggybacking off of that, um, bringing it back to the to the community. Um, somebody asked the question um, in the chat, how do they get involved politically? Pick a pick an issue. Uh, we all we all live in communities. Nobody lives in a silo. Pick an issue that's going on in yours uh, or that is affecting the uh, community that you care about and get involved that way. Um, the NASW PACE committees at the at the at the state level at the city level are really important. I'm the chair of the NASW PACE committee for New York City, um, and and part of that work is going into social work schools and trying to engage social work students uh, in this process of of finding social workers, selecting social workers to run for office. That's a really important part of this conversation. Uh, so really finding an issue that that you care about and that is important and getting involved in organizing in community is really important and then making those steps to translate that that organizing into political power thank you i um i second jason and louisa but i also want to um a second a third or whatever um this webinar i first of all i learned so much from my co-panelists i really learned a lot i think this you know sometimes these webinars are a little light this was heavy in a good way and I also want to um, thank the 
the, the, the people who participated in the chat and the people who are listening, very often, the, the very little um, shows up in the chat of substance. This was full of substance of things, and I'm sorry we couldn't answer and discuss all, all the questions. Um, and um, I want to thank the, the 100 people, about 100 people showed up for this webinar. That's a lot. That shows that there is interest in social work and discussing these political issues. I think that's really important. And finally, I just like to reiterate what I said before. When we do our organizing, we have to frame this in ways that do not blame the victim, beating the voter or whoever else. We, we know that about the poor, but we tend to do it about the voter. We have to blame the structures and target the structures. Some very good examples of that were presented in this webinar today, and then we should build on that. Oh, great. Well, first of all, this has just been phenomenal. I echo what Mimi said that, you know, I learned more today than, than you know, I felt like I was just coming to a webinar as opposed to participating in one because this was so, um, just so informational for me. I, um, I'm a strong believer in just getting in where you fit in, get in where you fit in. And that there are so many ways that we can continue this work and we must continue this work. Um, getting involved on the local level doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to um, join organizations or, or, or find people that are already organizing. It is in your own community, your civic associations, you know, understanding and knowing who your state representatives are in your city council people, just becoming more aware of the political uh, movers and shakers in your state. And, and what are the issues that people are organizing around? So I think that that is important. Um, and, and to find, I tell you where we, we really are not, we're not in the space of the political parties and the representative districts and working within systems that are already there that should be serving us. I think you should be involved in, in those processes. And then the second thing is I, I'm really focusing this on the millennials and the Gen Zs. There are websites, the millennialaction.org, uh, runforsomething.net, Look for places, national organizations that can train you on ways that you can be involved because we need you now more than ever. So that's that's my thought. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, and sticking with us throughout this whole thing. I want to really focus my closing on the comment that Charles made earlier, which we could spend a whole panel talking about how do we have a successful uh, multiracial democracy. Step one, we have to maintain democracy, right? We have to be able to keep it. Um, but I often think about and, and like thinking of, about this as an elected official is not going to be the elected officials alone that fix that kind of thing. A lot of the conversation is around like does policy drive culture or culture drive policy? You know, we could talk about that all day, but it's a little bit of both. It's thinking about where do you like Marla said fit in where do where you fit in, and there's room for everybody that's on this um, video and whoever you share it with to figure out where they fit in a lot of this work within the policy and the political space. Uh, running for office isn't going to be for everyone. You know, I'd love to have great elections where we have really good social work candidates running against each other, where it's really focused on the issues that, you know, someday that'll happen, but that isn't for everybody, but working maybe for a policy maker, um, working with advocacy organizations, doing things in your, your neighborhood, thinking about it that locally, all of that is really critical so we can drive forward the change and create the cultural change that we need to be able to be in a successful multiracial democracy. I take every opportunity I can uh, to plug Shannon Lane's book, which is right behind me on the bookshelf right there. Uh, so if you're looking at different ways to figure out how to engage, that book does a fantastic job of doing that and breaking it out through um, different social work, uh, political social work domains. It's called Political Social Work, really easy to remember. Um, so you probably just Google that. The, the title is, you're, you're welcome, Victoria. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully we have another conversation like this sometime soon. And I, before I turn it over to Daniel to, to close this out, I'll just say that uh, the an my answer is uh, is very is short. Uh, we have to build coalitions. We gotta um, talk to each other. We gotta build trust. You know, across different lines, and uh, that's not easy. You know, uh, however, if anybody can do it, social workers can do it, and we just gotta figure it out. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for moderating. Thank you, panelists, for this amazing conversation. Uh, clearly, this this shouldn't 
be where it ends. We should continue this in this forum and many others. And I know you all are in your networks. So thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to have the Brown School host uh, this important conversation. Um, well, thank you so much all uh, for attending. Uh, we will uh, put up a recording on our YouTube channel in the next 48 hours. So please pass this along to colleagues who maybe weren't able to uh, participate today live. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to continue that conversation. So um, with that, I will end our awesome webinar and thank you all. Everyone have a great rest of your uh, day and week. Thank you. Thank you.